All right. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. And welcome to the Youth Resilience in the Digital Age Conference. Bonjour ou bonsoir selon l'endroit où vous êtes et bienvenue à la conférence sur la résilience des jeunes. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Leslie Elliott and I am the National Programs Coordinator for Boys and Girls Clubs of Canada and I'll be moderating this session today. I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. The Canadian Teachers Federation and the Boys and Girls Clubs of Canada recognize the contributions of the First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples of Canada. Dans un esprit de réconciliation au nom du milieu de l'éducation, nous saluons et remercions les peuples autochtones à qui appartiennent les territoires sur lesquels nous sommes aujourd'hui. Before we start, I'd like to recognize that this initiative was made possible by funding from Employment and Social Development Canada. Please also note that today's session will be recorded so that the presentation can be available on the platform in the future. Avant de commencer, j'aimerais de vous rappeler que la session sera enregistrée pour qu'elle soit disponible après la conférence. A short Q&A period will follow the presentation. Please use the Q&A function to ask questions to the presenter or to communicate with technical staff. Feel free to use the chat function to connect with other participants, share resources, and interact. Veuillez noter que la session aujourd'hui se déroule en anglais. Cependant, soyez à l'aise à poser des questions ou à faire des commentaires dans le chat en français ou en anglais. At the end of the presentation, I will invite the presenters to answer your questions in the order that they were asked. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Julia Stoneman and Greg Monius from Inspire. Julia Stoneman is a men mentorship officer with the Rivers to Success program at Inspire. Ms. Stoneman is a member of the Mississippastic Cree Nation and grew up in the Northern Manitoba community of Lynn Lake. Julia holds a master's degree in rural development and her thesis research was conducted through indigenous methodologies that focused on indigenous sover sovereignty and community healing. Prior to INSPIRE, Julia worked in a variety of roles at Brandon University, indigenous student success officer, Indigenous Academic Advisor and Director of the Indigenous Peoples Centre. In addition, Julia served as a research assistant for a Canada Research Chair in Law and Health, leading multiple photo voice research projects. Greg Monias is Nehiao Two-Spirit from Northern Manitoba. He is a band member with Pimichikamak Cree Nation, but grew up between Thompson and Waboden. As an advocate for Indigenous education, Greg has worked in post-secondary institutions and with student governments to promote access to quality education for Indigenous youth. In his current role with INSPIRE, Greg helps oversee a national Indigenous mentorship program that creates meaningful and respectful relationships with the goal that our young people find success in their chosen fields. Greg is currently finishing graduate studies at Simon Fraser University and is located in Hamilton, Ontario. The presentation is called Rivers to Success, Creating a Safe Online Community for Indigenous Youth. Welcome Julia and Greg, and thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much for having us. And say everyone, welcome. Thank you for having us today. Uh, Greg is just going to share his presentation here. And I noticed that his name says Julie, but his name is Greg Monias, and we'll <laughs> <laughs> introduce ourselves shortly here. <laughs> uh, so while we're waiting for that, I can tell you quickly what we're going to talk about today. Uh, this here, this webinar is called Rivers to Success, Creating a Safe Online Community for Indigenous Youth. And we're going to talk a bit about our Rivers to Success Mentoring Indigenous Students program, uh, about our online portal, some of the safety precautions that we've put in place, some of the lessons that we've learned, and then also go through a resource that we created while we talked to uh, uh, two people who are part of a mentor and a mentee who are part of our program. So we'll, um, we'll get into that shortly here. But before we get started, I just quickly wanted to do a land acknowledgement of my own. Uh, I'm 
we like to always start off acknowledging the many First Nations, Inuit and Métis people who've walked this land for centuries before we came. Uh, we do believe that land acknowledgements are the start towards our journey towards reconciliation, but we also want to further acknowledge that as in um, that without being invited. So we want to respect all protocols that are within those territories and respecting the traditional protocols as well as the colonial laws as well. And as we live in a virtual moment, we'd also like to acknowledge the span that we have across uh, Turtle, Turtle Island and the way that we're able to connect with one another from each of our territories. So today I'm on Treaty 7 territory, it's the traditional territories of the Blackfoot nations, including the Siksika, Pikini, the Kainai, and the Sutuna Nation, and the Stoti Nakoda First Nations. To all Indigenous territories that we work in. Um, I myself, again, I am Julia Stoneman. I am a mentorship officer in INSPIRE in as, as a part of the Rivers to Success program. I am Cree from Northern Manitoba. I grew up in Lynn Lake, Manitoba, and I'm a member of Misopoistic Cree Nation. And I lived in Southern Manitoba, went to university there. I worked in post-secondary for quite a bit of time after I graduated from my degrees. And I worked with Indigenous students, which is how I transitioned into working in this program. I wanted to get more on the ground and close to them throughout their education journey. And I was able to do that within this program. So at this moment, I'm gonna pass it off to my partner, Greg, and he'll give a quick introduction to himself and then we'll, we'll get started. Thank you, Julia. Uh, Tanse, everyone. My name is Greg Monias. I am Cree from Northern Manitoba, uh, from Chikama Cree Nation, uh, families Monias McKay's Bears Chubbs. And I'm joining you today from the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabeg, um, which was acknowledged in the Dishes One Spoon Wampum Belt. So I'm in the Hamilton area. I uh, live just uh, outside in a town called Stony Creek. And I grew up in Thompson, between Thompson and Woboden, like was said in my bio, uh, but like Julia went to university for undergrad at Brown University, that's where Julia and I had met, and uh, did my degree there in music, actually, and then uh, worked in banking roles uh, for a number of years and worked in finance for, for a number of years and then worked at the BD School of Business uh, as a, a career advisor um, in Vancouver and uh, sort of transition from that role into this one here with Inspire. Uh, so that's who we are, uh, where we come from, and uh, sort of how we got to uh, speaking in front of you guys today. Uh, so can I ask him to, again, all Indigenous nations that we that we have to work on and that are privileged to work on and, and play in as well. Um, so I would like to talk, um, start the presentation off uh, by talking about our program, River Success. Um, so, this is a program that has been around in various other um, forms uh, in through the last 12 years, um, but Julie and I really wanted to, uh, to to change it into something a little bit different. And with the pandemic, uh, I've, I worked here, uh, my first day actually was March 23rd, which if you remember last year, that's exactly when everything started happening um, with the pandemic. So we really had to focus on what an online world would look like for this program specifically, uh, because we didn't really have a lot of uh, options to, to go in and do this program on the ground. Um, so our program is a national mentorship program that supports the academic success of Indigenous students and their smooth transition into further careers or education. So there are three, three streams in our program. There's one in high school that, that targets students between uh, grades 10 to 12 and, and as they transition into post-secondary. And then the post-secondary stream is for anybody who is currently attending post-secondary institution uh, in any capacity, whether that's your bachelor's degree, uh, grad studies, whether they're in college. Um, so it really supports their needs in that area. And then where third uh, stream is a career transition stream, which really uh, sets them up for success moving into um, meaningful careers in their industry or, or their area of study. Um, so we want to make sure that um, we're, we are a national program, so we're hitting a lot of different demographics uh, in a lot of provinces, a lot of First Nations and Métis Inuit uh, youth. So we have to be as broad as possible when trying to, uh, to talk about these, uh, about these issues that we'll be talking about today. 
Um, so the issue that we've really found uh, through the re through research um, through the TRSE, uh, so Truth Reconciliation Student Experience. Uh, so we identified the need to foster and measure cultural identity, a sense of belonging, and resiliency while reducing the social isolation that might inhibit quality learning and engagement for Indigenous students. So Julie and I both experienced this growing up in northern Manitoba in northern communities, um, moving to a bigger city. Um, to do post-secondary education was quite the shock for us. Um, and we really needed to gravitate towards um, the Indigenous Student Center uh, at that university to really find community and find balance in our what was home for us and what was our new home at university as we studied. So what we're trying to do in this program is to build that community that we found at university that others might not find um, in larger institutions or in institutions where Indigenous Student Centers uh, center don't exist. Um, and making sure that we're um, we're intentional about about being able to help students um, with their culture identity, with their sense of belonging and resiliency, um, to really impact their studies and and to really come away um, with learning um, and and making sure that they stick it out for the uh, entirety of their program. Um, so we do this through uh, mentorship. This is uh, something that we have sort of two streams in. We have um, group mentoring and one-to-one -one mentoring. So the group mentoring function um, is through things like events and resources and the option of bringing large groups together um, with a single uh, idea or a single topic where they maybe need help uh, with one mentor. And then we have one-to-one -one mentorship as well, where we will match a single person with a mentor and uh, they can meet as as often or, or as for as long as they would like uh, but we do have uh, the option to to match people uh, like that but when we look at mentorship we want to make sure that we're uh, developing the individual as a whole so throughout the program you'll see that we integrate and balance all aspects of the individual so the spiritual emotional intellectual and physical into that development process so we want to make sure that we're really looking at um, hosting cultural events, we're hosting physical events, um, we're making sure that all of these areas of the full person are always looked at when we're talking about um, development of, of young people. So throughout the program and throughout this presentation, we always have these four questions that were presented um, by um, Senator Murray Sinclair during the Truth and Reconciliation Commission about the guiding principles of who am I where am I going? What is my purpose? And who can help me? So throughout the process um, of mentorship and of our program, we have sort of three milestones that we want to hit. The beginning milestone is entering the program um, where we want them to ask them themselves these four questions. So who am I? Like what brought me here? Where am I going? What's my destination? What am I trying to get out of this? What is my purpose? Why am I here? And who in who out here can help me? And throughout this process, we want to develop these questions and, and making sure that students are always reflecting on, on this as we find that it grounds you as an individual and it really sets you for a, a longer path and a longer journey that's it's more defined. Um, so throughout this program and throughout this uh, presentation, um, you'll see these questions being answered kind of abstractly through the questions that we ask. Um, but this is what we're um, our guiding principles and where we're and where we take things from. Um, so, like I said at the beginning, um, we had to really beef up this online portal uh, for mentorship because we weren't able to um, to be face to face with people. We were right into COVID. Um, we everybody had to stay home. We weren't able to meet students one on one, so we had to bring everybody into an online portal. And so the portal that we chose uh, was called Mentor City, and it is a very um, good portal that allows us to really customize and focus in on exactly what we want to do. Um, so the, the highlights for us were we wanted to host resources, we wanted to host events, we wanted to have one-to-one -one and group mentoring in the program, and we wanted to make sure that it felt like a community with discussion boards and with um, with other types of information that we could share uh, in terms of like documents and videos and things in the community um, to really have a one-stop shop for everything that we needed to. And they were able to deliver that for us and also be able to influence, uh, have some indigenous cultural pieces into the portal, which was really good. Um, so some of the precautions that we have in, in place to make sure that this is a really safe uh, environment for everybody 
is all we require all of our mentors and mentees and all program participants to register through the portal. So the registration process asks for uh, first and last name, um, where you're from, your, your nation, what you're studying, um, and a few other basic information fields that really help identify who you are. And then once you've passed that registration um, section, all mentors are required to do a back check initiated by Sterling Back Check. Um, and so we, through that process, we're able to verify exactly who you are through TransUnion and do a criminal record check at the same time. Um, it's all kind of built into the portal. And so we can really quickly see um, if there is any red flags uh, for our mentors to make sure that our mentees are getting the most, uh, that they feel safe and that their parents feel safe with them in the, pro in the program and that, um, that we're making sure that we're giving them a quality experience. Within the portal as well, um, one thing that we were able to initiate and implement was a language filter. So this something is something that really um, is sort of in the back end and, and people using the portal might not ever see this or notice this. It's not, it's not necessarily visible to them, but if they were to use uh, profanity or marginalizing language or inappropriate language in the portal and they were to type it in, uh, when they click send, it will look as though the message has sent to them, but it will not actually, the other user won't receive the message until it's approved by us. So we have a list of words, both in English and in French that um, we have deemed as inappropriate and to flag it with us um, right away so that it, those messages will never reach their intended user. Um, unless it was like a spelling error or for some reason it was uh, it was inappropriate, but we can also connect with that initial sender and, and make sure that we were correcting that right away. Um, we can also see the profiles and discussions on the portal. So if there's any ever like discussion boards that are kind of taking a, a turn, um, we can, we always uh, take a look at that and making sure that our discussions are, are healthy and they're uh, meaningful and making sure that they're not using marginalized language. Uh, we can also see the profiles of everybody uh, and we have access to, to limiting uh, view of certain sections of profiling of, of users profiles. Um, so we can go in and really make sure that um, there is, again, no marginalizing language, making sure that uh, everybody is uh, in, uh, in essence, trying to maintain a safe and healthy uh, environment for everybody, all the users. Um, so like I said, this is one section, the mentorship portion is one section of our portal. We also have like two other massive sections. The first is resources. So every single one of our resources is vetted or developed in-house. Um, so we can really control the narrative um, within those resources. And we also have a limited access to outside resources. And the ones that we do um, are long-term partners of ours. So um, there are partners that we will co-develop resources with and use experts in every, all uh, the industry that the resource is in to really draft language that's inclusive um, and culturally relevant as well. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we're really using um, really welcoming and safe language throughout all of the resources. In our events, um, we like to, as we did here today, um, start with a land acknowledgement and making sure there's um, there's language representation and there's Indigenous representation in all of the events that we do, uh, making sure that they're culturally safe and welcoming. We also like to open our events with elders and, and have them open the events in a good way and to put our minds uh, in, in a good in a good place walking into the into the event. And uh, for most often, our elders will stay throughout the event um, just to be there uh, as a respect figure and also to close out the event at the end. Um, so also in events, what we like to do is we like to create space um, for someone uh, to connect with someone. So whether that be through a discussion, whether that be through uh, us asking for immediate feedback, uh, whether that's an email that comes up later, we wanna make sure that in, say, in these spaces where um, actively asking people to communicate with us as presenters or us as facilitators or us as just mentorship officers supporting facilitators or speakers because we believe that that back and forth language really starts to create and build that community. Um, but when we do that in our, in our meetings, we wanna make sure that we're setting the stage for a safe space. So we always have a safe space clause in our uh, events that's just reminds everybody that this is a safe space, that we are not using marginalizing language, that we are, um, focus on Indigenous uh, practices because we are Indigenous people and in the program we really cater to the Indigenous youth uh, and population and we want to make sure that um, that we're thinking about the seven grandfather teachings and that um, 
people who are maybe outside of um, gender or um, uh, sexual orientation uh, that is outside of uh, the binary that we can really include everybody um, equally. So that's sort of what we do uh, for portal safety precautions. Um, if anyone does have any questions about the specifics of the Mentor City portal and what we do on a day-to-day -day basis and how that kind of looks or what sort of other uh, safeguards you might have in place, feel free to message us and ask us. Um, we are pretty open to, to sharing and to, to making sure that we're creating safe spaces across, um, across our, our country. So with that, uh, we will move into uh, introducing our two speakers that we've decided uh, to promote for this event and to ask these questions to. Um, this is Tiana and Rebecca. Um, they are both in different stages of lives and perspectives that they can really speak from. Um, we know them both uh, personally as well. They're both uh, really close, uh, either close friends or colleagues of ours. Uh, so we really and trusted their advice and what they're uh, willing to share and, and say, and we really value their opinion. And also they're both participants of the, of the program. So they're people that if you were to join the program, people you might interact with. So the purpose of the discussion, uh, so the goal of this resource that we created uh, is to highlight the voices and insights of Indigenous youth who access online spaces and communities and the people who support them. So the R2S program, like I said, is a free stream program um, where our first point of access to students will be, of course, the high school stream. Um, so the mentorship officers, um, we really wanted to make sure that we're um, showing you guys what the portal might uh, might contain and all the safety measures, uh, language filters, things like that. But we also wanted to talk about um, we talk, uh, target community organizations and youth and um, so that we have customized resources, we have group mentorship gatherings, um, just to really develop those self-advocacy skills and to create boundaries in a connected, engaged and safe space and to build an online community that listens, supports and empowers. So this is two of our speakers. Uh, so Tiana Bowen is Anishinaabe from Kisi Kuwini and Ojibwe First Nation in Treaty 2 Territory in Manitoba. She is a first year MA student at OICI, which is the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education, with a focus on land-based education curriculum that deconstructs and identifies barriers to Indigenous youth accessing cultural and ceremonial spaces. Uh, and the next speaker that we'll pre I'll be presenting is Rebecca Ogamau. She is an Inno educator from the Treaty 5 territory in Manitoba and a band member of Manitoba Sagayagan First Nation, uh, currently living and working in Treaty 2 territory. She has been an educator for six years and working with Indigenous youth for the entirety of her career. She recently completed a Master of Education with a focus in guidance and counseling and has been working as a guidance counselor. So you might be noticing a Manitoba theme here across the presentation, but we are spread out across Canada. Uh, Tiana was in, um, she's at OIC, but she was at UBC before. Uh, Rebecca, I think, is the only one still in Manitoba. I'm in Ontario, and of course, Julia is in Alberta. So joining you from all parts of uh, the country today. So I will pass it off to back to Julia for the first question. Thank you, Greg. Okay, so like Greg said, we'll uh, watch a bit of the clip as we ask the two speakers to discuss this and then we'll come back and we can do a little bit of recap on it and then talk about how we've worked to implement this into our program. So the first question that we asked, what do you consider a safe online space for Indigenous youth? And there's about two minutes of video here. First question we have is what do you consider a safe online space for Indigenous youth and is there more to consider when working with this demographic? I'm going to pass this to Tiana first. Um, personally, I consider a safe online space for Indigenous youth to be a place that is free of judgment. The newer generation of Indigenous youth are a lot louder about who they are and don't need to be shamed for it. Uh, online spaces should be an open and understanding of should be open and understanding of individual journeys. If you want Indigenous youth to participate in online communities, you have to create inclusive spaces, and that means calling out and having no tolerance for toxic behaviors such as heterosexism, homophobia, transphobia, and patriarchal stances. There is definitely a lot more to consider when working with Indigenous youth, so it's important 
that these spaces are culturally safe and relevant. And by that, I just mean that when creating the space, you are mindful of Indigenous people's history and the struggles we face today. On the other hand, you also want to highlight the accomplishments and positives of Indigenous people too. For example, understanding that we are facing the aftermath of colonialism, but a lot of Indigenous nations are reclaiming and adapting our cultures to fit with our new realities. Yeah, I agree. Thank you, Tiana. Uh, Rebecca, do you have anything to add? Um, I would just say that coming from an educator's perspective and creating a safe space for Indigenous youth, I think that it's very important to be open and welcoming as some, especially teens or like um, high school students, they're not familiar with these platforms. So making sure that they feel welcome, that you are acknowledging them when they are taking those first steps to join these spaces. Um, as a facilitator, you are teaching them the rules of the first time that they're coming into the, the online spaces. And so they are learning how to respect and to have discussions online um, and learning the language about appropriateness and understanding what is appropriate and what isn't. Um, and then also when they are coming into these spaces, you're going to provide them um, with speaking opportunities and making sure you're, you're giving them the opportunity to pass if they don't feel comfortable the very first time that they're in um, one of these spaces. Um, yeah. So we've been asking this question for some time now, just how do we create an online space? How do we protect the people that we're working with, the youth and the mentors? And within the research, within uh, hearing back from the participants that we work with, we're hearing the same thing, which is the measurements of success that Greg went over. Uh, they need that feeling of belonging, that connection to community, that identity to give them the resiliency to handle everything that comes with navigating the online world. And, uh, and then that connection to culture because it, it enforces everything that comes with the belonging and the resilience. So taking some points that the students talked about, culturally safe uh, atmosphere, just making sure that these students are free to be themselves, that they feel that there's representation, that they see themselves in the people that they speak to, the people they're listening to, even just in the online spaces that they're in. Uh, with For ourselves within our portal, we, we find that within our, when we're promoting our events, which we'll show you a little bit later, we want to make sure that we're seeing faces. We want to see those big brown smiling faces that you might not always see when you're um, in other spaces because uh, like you'll hear going forward there's when you're an Indigenous youth coming into the online world there is a lot to navigate and there is a lot that you won't identify with um, and then being mindful of the history being mindful of everything that these youth are carrying knowing the world that they walk in is different than maybe um, mainstream youth or just youth from different backgrounds and understanding the weight that comes with that understanding you know the difference between somebody who is an intergenerational residential school survivor, someone who doesn't have adequate housing, food stability, who comes from high suicide. There's a lot of um, layers that come with working with youth who've done, who've been a part of this. And it's having, making sure that we make them feel safe and that they know that we are that safe net and that they can come to us. Um, always highlighting accomplishments. This is something that I truly believe in and everywhere that I work is that positivity really does matter because like we said, there is so much negativity that any chance we get to highlight it, we need to take it no matter how big or small that is. So for ourselves in the program, uh, we, for our events, we make sure that we bring speakers in, that we're highlighting their faces, that we let them write their bios in whatever way they want to present themselves, whatever way that they feel they want to share about themselves that they're proud of. Um, and then in our newsletters, we're doing things like highlighting relationships with people, someone who has done really well in something like going to resources and they've really worked on themselves in this journey. Uh, another big part too is the responsibility of the teachers. It's the responsibility to know that 
when you come into this space, you are taking on the responsibility to be there for these youth to make sure that they're comfortable. Um, you might not come from a place of understanding from a different place from them, but having that patience to sit there and to listen to them and to trust them and for them to know that maybe we don't understand one another, but I am here to, to make sure that I will understand someday that no matter what, there's unconditional support and acceptance in this space. And all I want is for you to succeed in what you feel is a success to you. Um, hearing students. So what was also a part of this program, uh, what we took into account, like Greg said, was the TRC recommendations. We took those and then we also surveyed our bu building brother building brighter future students. Uh, so in Inspire, we're mostly known for the scholarships and bursaries that we offer to students, which uh, the research shows is makes such an impact when they have that financial freedom and support for themselves and their families in school. But we asked them, how can we make these recommendations a reality? And what else do you need beyond this? Where are the gaps that we can fill in? So we got that data back and we sat in a room and we just had everything there to make the program. And we just said, how do we make this a reality? And even now in our program with everything that we do, any step we take, we ask the people we're working with, especially the youth, what is it that you need? How do you need it? And how can we, how, what way can we give it to you? So um, yes, hearing from the students is very important to us in this program and especially in our development because it is our first year in this program and we're growing so much from what the previous ones were. We still wanna hear from them. and We wanna make sure that those three measurements of success are being um, impacted. And this also creates community. When people feel like they're heard, when they feel like you care what they have to say and you're working to help them, they wanna keep coming back. They feel comfortable. They wanna be here and they wanna be a part of it. So that's super important in making sure that they're engaged and that they keep coming because there's a lot of areas and there's a lot of spaces that they've been disappointed as Indigenous youth and they're not able to have that understanding and support that they need. And it's up to us to make sure that we're doing everything in our power to do that. And lastly, just yeah, what it says on here, free of judgment and acceptance, just to not judge them and understand where they're at in their journey, where they're going and what they want to do and have that trust in them for themselves. So uh, we'll go on to the second question here, which I think I'll pass back over to Greg to discuss. Yeah, sorry. Um, so the next question we had was, how do we prepare Indigenous youth for the troubling and harmful language or experiences they may encounter in the online world? So basically, how do we teach critical thinking to Indigenous youth? So I have another video here. Um, same video, sorry, just later on <laughs> in the clip. Um, so I will share. How do we prepare Indigenous youth for the troubling and harmful language or experiences they may encounter in the online world? And uh, Tiana, do you want to answer that one first? So when you make the decision to join the online world, you are making various accounts and agreeing to different community guidelines and terms of agreements. Um, so it is important to note that even though there are community guidelines in place, you are creating your own community based on either your following base, those you follow, or who you are interacting with online. As Indigenous youth are learning to navigate the online world, they should be prepared to see negative comments and perceptions of Indigenous people and, indig and indigeneity that some people hold. I think the best advice I can give to Indigenous youth navigating okay. online communities is making choices to create and maintain a safe space for yourself. It might take trial and error before you know how to identify which spaces are for you and which are not, but it is important that you stay true to yourself and not allow the opinions of others make you forget your self-worth or self-respect. Creating online boundaries are just as important as creating real life in-person boundaries. Okay, so in follow-up to Tiana's answer and the question we just asked, uh, Rebecca, a question for you. How do we teach critical thinking to Indigenous youth? I think critical thinking is super important um, when learning how to maneuver uh, online. Um, it's super important for them to be able to identify uh, things that are positive and negative and identify when enough is enough and create 
creating boundaries as Tiana had spoken in the, in the previous question. Um, I think having a strong identity is really important in knowing when to make those choices um, and being connected to who they are. Thank you. And uh, yeah, like Greg had mentioned in the overview for the Rivers program, it's nice to hear that these answers tie into what we measure our success on, which, like we said, is a sense of identity and sense of resiliency. So we can see in all areas of life that these teachings can be instilled to empower youth and in every area that they're encountering. So I'll hand it off to Greg for the next question. All right, so just to go over some of those again, um, just sort of really, really reinforce what we're what we're learning here. Uh, know your online community guidelines. Um, far often than not, our, our young people are entering contracts um, in online spaces and as uh, educators and as parents, we need to make sure that we're, we ourselves know what those online community guidelines and online restrictions are and what, uh, what is being shared online in, in those spaces and being active in, in your engagement with those with those spaces. As Indigenous youth, we're, we're oftentimes our, our first interaction with life outside the reserve or life outside Northern communities is online spaces. So we really gravitate towards those to really start to formulate our worldview. So making sure that we're um, being actively engaged in that process. Um, for young people to know their boundaries. Um, we create boundaries in social situations within our, our, our own personal lives in day-to-day -day life, but we need to make sure that we're carrying those boundaries online and that we're creating a, a net of, of safe space for ourselves um, to make sure that if there are negative comments out there, um, that we just delete them off of our profile or we just don't engage with them and being able to really establish and set those boundaries. Maybe we um, stop watching negative videos on TikTok or um, on YouTube so that our, our recommended feeds uh, constantly promote positive material and having those conversations with young people of what those recommended videos and what the next video um, comes from. Uh, prepare for hurtful negative language. So not everybody uh, comes to online spaces uh, in a good way. Um, a lot of them are hurting. So making sure that you're preparing young people for hurtful negative language, how they can react uh, is very important and how you react to hurtful and hateful language and, and marginalizing language um, it, it is important for the development socially from young people into their adult lives. And I think that uh, this is a really good opportunity as young people are first accessing online spaces to really consider uh, making the right choices to create a safe space. Like I said, keep your keep your online circle tight. I mean, you know, we have a lot of, um, there's a lot right now, is, uh, uh, social media has a huge push for how many followers can you get? Well, maybe those followers aren't healthy for you. Maybe they're either creating a, an unhealthy, uh, toxic environment for you where you need to maybe restrict profiles or maybe uh, only select certain people to, to remain in your tight social media circle. Um, learn to identify negative positive experiences. Um, so making sure that um, we know what a negative situation looks like, how to handle it, how to maybe turn it into a positive learning experience and work to create a strong identity. So through the program, we like to hit all of these points where we understand vocabulary, we don't internalize negative behavior. Uh, we teach students how to deal with negative comments and views so that it isn't internalized with you. So you don't view it as yourself and it impacts your, uh, your worth. And um, so we want to make sure that we're creating a space that has all of these pieces built in, whether it's like immediate, a visible barrier or a visible boundary or a visible change or something on the back end where they might not see it every day, like those community guidelines. Um, so making sure that you're being mindful of all the lived experiences that this person might carry in into this into your online space and then moving out of it as well uh, and navigating into their own um, so in the portal we're really we're really careful about the boundaries that we set and, and exactly what we're allowing students and and mentors both to do um, and how to engage and how to actively communicate and uh, so we do that through our orientation process, through uh, active mentorship hours, um, making sure that we're hosting events and, and really reinforcing, like I said, that, that uh, creating safe space. So I'm gonna move to the next part of that. Um, yeah, so like I, uh, all, these, all these views I just, uh, just had. Um, 
So this last question here is where are we going as we transition to a new online reality and ways of connecting to culture, identity, and community? So let's go and watch what um, our speakers say to that. I hear those birds at the beginning of all of our videos. Um, they're birds from back home. Um, I just think that because it has been so open, um, the beginning of this pandemic has really opened the door and the opportunity for people to share um, across, all across Turtle Island. Um, we have seen so many collaborations, so many different um, things coming out and being shared on in different, many different platforms. And I think it's amazing how uh, you people are connecting with Indigenous culture, culture, people that are non-Indigenous, that are learning things that they won't necessarily learn in school, from mainstream media, from uh, different applications, because the filters don't often show them this type of information. We all know it. Um, so creating those allies and those relationships and working towards reconciliation. I think there has been some um, work that has gone in on in this area and lots of uh, people have done many positive things. Um, and it's opened many doors for Indigenous youth to connect with other mentors um, by being able to see different things that are associated with their culture. Um, they're able to connect with different communities and also they are able to strengthen their identities and maybe see things that they haven't um, had the opportunity for on, with these platforms. For sure, thank you. So she did uh, have that that idea again of, of entering those those spaces and different apps uh, you, that you might have on your phone. Um, so we have a couple highlights here. Uh, opportunity to share across Turtle Island. So we need to be able to develop and share our learnings and teachings across Turtle Island through these um, online uh, platforms. Um, and we see that there are um, massive spaces in apps that promote this. So you can see things like native TikTok has really taken off in the last year. Um, that really goes to show a, a pride in the culture and a pride nationally, internationally, and, and how beautiful Indigenous culture can be um, away from the negativity and the racism and, and all the hatred and hate speech that comes from other parts of the app. Um, so creating those boundaries for yourself and, and, and providing an opportunity to share uh, across Turtle Island building opportunity for connection to Indigenous culture. These apps don't have built-in Indigenous uh, features or Indigenous as aspects. So making sure that we're you're finding opportunities to showcase to your student or your child or, or whomever in your life that, that there are spaces within these applications that, that really focus on Indigenous culture and they can learn from this uh, in, in a good way and, and, from, and from leaders in our communities. Uh, also creative collaborations. So being being intention, uh, in, like intentional about who you're bringing into your platform and, and what specific collaborations can be, um, whether that's social media or in-house networking, just to really control that narrative and, and meet the younger generation where they are. So we're uh, developing some resources now where we're, we're, we're finding opportunities on YouTube, opportunities on TikTok, opportunities on Facebook, Instagram, Instagram Live, um, to really meet the, gen the younger generation exactly where they are. Um, with good collaborators and, and and with people who are willing to build that uh, that culture and bring those teachings uh, online, which is not a typical area for Indigenous teachings. Um, also, connection to each other and allies. So we need to be able to um, identify who allies in Indigenous communities are. They might look like your teacher, or they might look like uh, a school administrator, or a school counselor, or um, I guess even uh, developers at Facebook in some way, we need to be able to that those that the allies exist in those spaces and they're open and willing and 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 like working on themselves to do the work that is required on their side of the of the fence of reconciliation. Um, so just be mindful of, of, of the experience that you walk in and the ex as an ally and the experience that the, that the youth might walk in as an indigenous young person um, and making sure that you're able to 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 view 
um, they're, where they're coming from and, and find opportunities to partner if you don't feel like you're the, the right fit for that, uh, for that person. And national connection to mentors. Like I said, we're the native TikTok. Those are group mentors to these people. They are really promoting a sense of pride and culture and, and resiliency um, in the language, in the dancing, in um, some of the art forms that we that we have as Indigenous people. Uh, really promoting them on a national scale and being able to to really showcase to these young people that they should be proud of who they are because they're not learning this stuff in their schools. Uh, for, many of them are not learning this uh, on in their curriculums, or they're not learning this in their online spaces. But we are creating our own communities within these larger um, within these larger apps. So I think that's really important to see. Um, so I'll hand it back to Julia just to uh, talk a little bit about uh, sort of a recap here. Just uh, going off of what Greg was just talking about with the representation and the national connection uh, for myself and just speaking as a mother as well, I never experienced this in my whole life to see myself, my culture, the songs, the dancing, the art. Um, I felt, especially moving to the South from the North, you feel very disconnected and lost. And I think how much of an impact that would have had on me. And I think to my kids now that they get to watch this and this is normal to them, you know, I'm saying to them now, you guys are so lucky and they don't understand, but I'm happy because they shouldn't have to understand that. They should know what it's like to just, see themselves and celebrate it out there um, in the online world. Um, so we took a couple notes here, just some things that maybe you could implement in your program today to make it a safer space for Indigenous youth, but also things that take more work, obviously, in that you have to really just hunker down and put time and energy into it. Uh, the first thing that I would say that you can especially do today is, is be a student. Always take the opportunity to learn um, in our program, we do have the mentor and the mentee roles, but it's important to us that they know that they're teachers. They both have responsibility to teach one another. And that's how the reciprocal relationship is for the whole program. Um, for myself, even it's a national program and I am an indigenous person, but I'm only Cree. I don't know how to work in nations across Canada. So I'm always trying to connect with people, trying to connect with the students to ask about their experiences, to connect with the knowledge keepers, to connect with the community, to know that it's, to know what it's like to have that experience so that you can make sure the work that you're doing is impactful. Uh, Another part of that is just making sure that in that, when you're being a student, it shows that you care to learn about this work, that you care about what you're doing, that you're taking on that responsibility to make sure that this is done in the right way, because that isn't always put in place for Indigenous youth. And that's one of the biggest things that we need is them to know that that relationship is set in. Um, but I, for sure, that, that, that would be more of a long-term one. Uh, ask yourself the four questions when you're doing this work, when it comes to working with the youth. Why are you doing this work? What is the purpose? What do you want to accomplish? Are you here for the right reasons? Because this is a vulnerable population and they need to be supported in the best ways. So take those four questions and they can be applied anywhere into the program, into yourself as well in helping to guide you. And I know for us, we do that daily, almost weekly, where we have to look back at everything that we're doing and is this the right way to do this, to support one another. Um, and then don't, don't, don't come as uh, controlling it here from the students again. So another example with our program is we're in an academic program. We're known for supporting people in their education. However, this year when it came to our resources and our events and the support that people needed, it wasn't with help writing papers and getting ready for exams and all of that, the connection even in post-secondary, it was, I miss beating, I miss community, I miss talking to people. Like I haven't been moving, I need motivation. So we based our events and our resources off of that mental health and that connection with one another. Uh, we did events that was painting. We brought people together to paint, a uh, Cree painter, uh, Norval Morisot, one of his paintings, and then we told a winter story. And we sat together and we stayed on an extra half an hour long because people didn't want to get off and we just painted and talked and it, it was what people needed. Uh, we switched to doing online workouts. We 
actually took a videographer and Greg went with them and they went out into a garden and they videotaped somebody in the garden uh, so that people could go online, but they could still feel that online connection because that is what they needed to be supported this year more than anything. September, it'll probably be a different story and we'll focus more on the academic side and hopefully everyone is at that place, but it's, it's assessing where you're at and hearing from the students, what is it that we need to uh, support you. Long-term, uh, there's so much research out there. It's been researched to death what Indigenous students need to um, succeed, what they need to uh, do well in you know, modern life, in person and in the virtual world. So taking the time to read it and to understand it and to have a relationship with it. There's a difference between reading it and from knowing the actual story and feeling the impact and feeling the stories of the people and the youth that you're working with and you're creating a space for. Um, representation, like we said, uh, you know, it, it's, it can be difficult, especially in the online world with what you're working with. But an example, again, what we've done is in the videos that you heard, that bird in the beginning is a bird that is heard every morning in the north. If you're from the north, you know that bird. So, and then at the end of the video, we put loons because there's always loons in the evening. So for us, we feel a lot of times we can't reach the north. We're not doing what we can, but we're, we're doing our best, right? But in some ways we can bring that into our program. We put the birds into the videos so that when they hear it, they're like, oh, that's from back home. They're thinking of me, that's familiar. That makes my heart feel good. Those little things can make a difference um, in these spaces because it, it's not very common to, uh, to hear it. And um, one thing that I definitely took from, especially Tiana, when we were doing this resource is that youth want to hear the difficult conversations. They want to have the difficult conversations. Like they're so resilient. They're ready to go out there and conquer whatever it is that they need to face and they want the information to do it. And I think that as the people who are taking on working with them, it's our responsibility to do that for them, to prepare them in every way possible and then set them free to make that community, to make that online community, that in-person community with all the tools that we've, we've given them. Uh, so we can actually, we'll show you really quickly a couple examples of some resources and events that we've done in our program that, uh, that have tried to reinforce what we've been hearing from the youth. So this here is a couple modules that we've done. Like we said, uh, we had to shift a lot of our attention to the portal because with the pandemic, there was such a change in everything. And we wanted to make sure that when people came onto this portal, that they had a space of support, that they could come into it, even if you weren't meeting with your mentor at the time, you could look around these different modules and find what you needed at that day and moment. So we've done a few things. The mental health one uh, module, we're very proud of some resources we've done. We partnered with CAMH and then we formed online elder and youth circles. And we asked them, what do you need to, uh, what, how can we support you? What, what content do you need in there? How do we say it to youth in the way that impacts them? And they guided us for everything. So we've developed some tip sheets. We're doing some animation videos. Uh, the medicine teachings was, like I said, in the garden, where we got that video in the garden on the land shot so that people could have that connection. So we've also done things in self-advocacy because, like we said, uh, the resiliency is there. You need to learn how to advocate for yourself. And then the cultural side helps to build the identity, too. So this is a little bit of our resources, how we try to create that community, try to give them the tools for their toolbox to succeed while they're out there in the world and, uh, and to support them. And if you wanna to go to the events, Greg. And these are a couple of our events. So in December, November, and late November, December time, we were asking people, what, what do we need at this moment? And people were just so burnt out in the program. They just wanted to get together and do something to relax. And we did a beading series and it was so fun. We had people coming over three weeks just to gather and bead. And we had a lead beater, but you would have one of the aunties come in and take over the whole session and be teaching us something. And it was so great to just have that opportunity. Uh, we partnered with Rogers and we had these three speakers come in and talk about their journeys and to talk to the youth about how what they've overcome and then how they've come to the places where they're at in their roles in Rogers and it's this really matters because people can see first of all that there is jobs in these areas which they might not know about and that there's people like them in these jobs 
Uh, yeah, and these are just a couple more. We did a powwow workout to keep people active, keep the cultural side in there. And we've done some mentoring tips. Where we brought in speakers like Claudette Commanda to give us tips on how do we support one another because that's important too in our program is learning how to build up that support and prepare mentors for supporting everyone. Uh, with that, that's, and I'll ask Greg if he has anything that he wants to uh, add, but that's, that's our presentation. No, I think that's good. If you do have uh, any questions, uh, let them let us know. Uh, but if you if we think of a question later on, just email us at rivers at inspire.ca. Uh, that's our joint uh, inbox. So you can definitely uh, let us know. Also, if you want to join the program as a mentor or as a mentee, um, please let us know. Contact us at rivers uh, at inspire.ca and we can get you involved in the program for sure. So thank you very much, Julia and Greg. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed this amazing presentation. Merci beaucoup, Julia and Greg. J'espère que vous avez tout apprécié cette excellente présentation. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, please feel free to throw them in the Q&A. Um, just take a quick look in the chat. Just some thank yous. Uh, so we're pretty much at the end. Oh, here we go. Are we able to access any of those resources ourselves if we want to utilize them with our youth? Yeah, so right now we're just in the process this week actually of building our resource website. And if you join the program, they're also all hosted on our portal. Thank you. Okay, if there are any other, if there are no other questions. Well, this brings us to the end of our session. Uh, we invite you to view uh, the resources and recordings of the event on the conference page, which is at digitalresilience.ca. And I believe that's in the chat. Um, and also a reminder to tweet about the conference session using uh, hashtag digital resilience 2021 and tag us on social media. So thank you again, Julia and Greg, for answering questions and for this great presentation on how to support Indigenous youth to develop self-advocacy skills, to create boundaries in a connected, engaged, and safe space, and to build a supportive online community. I really appreciated also hearing from Tiana and Rebecca within your presentation. It was a pleasure to have you with us. And thank you all for attending. Merci à toutes et à tous d'avoir assisté à la séance.